Chapter 1, Part 3, Ebbinghaus's Experiments on Memory. Some learning textbooks write that Ebbinghaus emancipated psychology from philosophy. What they mean is that before Ebbinghaus, psychology was a subset of philosophy. Philosophers constructed ideas and theories about how the mind works and then presented their arguments to other philosophers. Now, psychologists study the mind and behavior through systematic observation and experimentation. We construct theories based on pre-existing empirical evidence, collect evidence to test our hypotheses, and we try to make our cases to one another and to the public by presenting our data. Ebbinghaus was the first to do so. He generated psychology's first learning curve. Now, his experiments were simple, and some of his methods would not be used today. For example, he was his own experimental subject, which introduces the possibility of bias, even if it's unconscious bias, and could impact the accuracy of his observations. Imagine it must have been difficult to make accurate recordings of the participant's behavior while you were also being the participant. And as Mazur pointed out, Ebbinghaus's results have been replicated using modern methods. So everything we talk about in this video uh, has been replicated with additional subjects. Right here's Ebbinghaus's general method, the one that he used in, in many of his experiments. He created lists of nonsense syllables, such as hack, piff, zap, and then tested how long it took himself to memorize the list. He used nonsense syllables so that the participant himself didn't have any prior associations with any of the words on any of the lists. This was important because it ensured that all lists were equally unfamiliar at the start of the experiment, an important source of experimental control. Some psychology experiments today still rely on nonsense syllables for the same reason. Ebbinghaus would read a list over and over at a steady pace periodically testing himself to see if he could recite the list from memory. He then recorded the number of repetitions needed to recite the list perfectly. I'm going to call that initial repetitions. And that probably sounds to you like a dependent variable. But it wasn't his main dependent variable. Right? So he recorded his initial repetitions, and then he tested himself later and in that later test, he recorded the number of nonsense syllables that he was able to recall correctly uh, right away. That's the uh, retention. And also the number of repetitions of the list he needed until he could recall the list perfectly again. And I'm going to call that his final repetitions. But neither of those is his main DV. So those are also not dependent variables. Ebbinghaus's dependent variable is savings, the difference between the initial and final number of repetitions needed, expressed as a percentage of the initial repetitions. For example, if it took Ebbinghaus 20 repetitions to be able to recite a particular list the first time he memorized it, but only 15 repetitions to get to that point where it's perfectly memorized 24 hours later, that's a savings of five repetitions, which is 25% of the initial 20 repetitions. So savings of 25%. Now, if it seems like I'm going over this in way too much detail, it's because I really want this example to be concrete and to make sense for everyone. And if this example still doesn't make sense for you yet, don't worry. We're going to go over similar examples in class. Of course, an experiment needs at least one independent variable that the experimenter manipulated in addition to the dependent variable they measured. And as you might expect, Ebbinghaus used different independent variables for different experiments. Here's one example. Uh, after he learned it perfectly the first time, Ebbinghaus continued repeating uh, the list. So he continued that repetition 
uh, in one of these experiments. So he learned it perfectly and then kept going. Uh, that's overlearning. Uh, so in that case, the experiment is about overlearning. The independent variable is the number of additional initial repetitions. And the result was that savings were greater when he added initial repetitions than when he did not. In other words, that overlearning promoted retention. Here's another example. To test Thomas Brown's hypothesis that associations are stronger for more recent pairings, that's the recency effect, Ebbinghaus used different retention intervals, that's the time between the initial and final test, for different lists. So the experiment tested the recency test, recency effect, the independent variable was the retention interval, the amount of time between tests, and the result was that his savings were less for longer intervals. And this is something we can graph as a forgetting curve. All right, one more example. To test Aristotle's principle of contiguity, that is that adjacent items on uh, Ebbinghaus's lists should be easier to recall. Ebbinghaus would, rem would memorize two lists, where the second list presented the same items, the same nonsense syllables as the first one, just in a different order. Now, the contiguity principle generates the hypothesis that the second list should be easier to learn when adjacent items on that second list were also close together on the first list than uh, it would be if the adjacent items on the second list were far apart on the first list. And this hypothesis was supported. These slides were created by James E. Mazur to accompany the eighth edition of Mazur Learning and Behavior 2017. They were adapted by me, Liz Kayanka, in 2020 for Cal State East Bay's Psychology 310 Conditioning and Learning.